Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today we are winding back the clock almost exactly 12 months where we last flew out to California and spoke to Mark Leaston over at Illuminate Financial. Mark, how are you? I'm very good, Toby. Thank you very much for having me here again. Great to see you. Likewise, likewise. And again, it looks like we've got roaring weather over there. I'm, I'm jealous as it's uh, slightly overcast again over, over these over these shores. I know you were back over recently, but how are things? Been well? Been well. Been incredibly, uh, been incredibly busy. Managed to managed to get a couple of trips over to the UK since uh, since I last saw you, which is a whole uh, education in itself. The joys of uh, <laughs> the joys of modern travel. But I don't know if we have time to go into that today. But uh, yeah, it's no, a whole other show. Busy. A whole other show. Listen, Mark, it's always great to speak to you and have you on the show. I'm really looking forward to unpicking what's been happening over the last year for you, for you and, and, and the business. But before we get into that, you know, there'll, there'll be people there who didn't catch the last one. Give us a little bit of a, an insight into Mark Beeston and Illuminate Financial. Sure. Well, let's do it in reverse order. So, so Illuminate Financial, we're a purely financial markets technology focused VC. I launched the firm seven years ago uh, and we are on the ground in London, New York, California and Singapore, 15, 15 people now. We launched our first fund in 2015, which was a £35 million fund backed or anchored by Market and uh, Deutsche Börse. I made 12 investments uh, from that fund, sold the first one to Bloomberg in 2019. And then we launched our second fund in 2019, did a final close of that this year, thanks to the joys of fundraising through Brexit and COVID. It went on a little bit longer than we uh, might have expected, but more than double the size, £72 million. We've made 12 investments already from that fund. Again, anchored by Deutsche Börse and Market and excitingly got our first bank LPs into that fund as well, which I'm sure we'll talk about more later. Yeah, well, look, no, no time like the present. It's, I think that's extremely exciting stuff that you're talking about there, isn't it? Because it, it's, the, the funds have performed incredibly well. Uh, the second fund closing now at the moment and having those sort of, you know, those first investments from, from the banks. So talk to us a little bit about what, what you went through with that and how it all came to part, all came apart. Yeah, sure. So look, I mean, as an emerging manager, you know, what, what people don't kind of appreciate is, you know, fundraising for a second fund, you know, can all, you know, and even perhaps a third one can almost be harder than raising for the first, right? The first one is, you know, people that you know kind of backing you, and that's great. But but when you kind of come back to market a couple of years later, you know, you're not going to uh, likely have had huge numbers of exits from the first fund. So you know, the mark to market might look good on paper, but, you know, ultimately, you know, cash is king. So, you know, you're largely raising from a, a similar a similar group of people, right? And, uh, you know, we got a first close done at the start of, start of 2019, and we started investing from that fund. And then getting towards the end of that year, you know, as Brexit was kind of dominating the headlines, it was very, very clear that that was going to become a big, you know, a big challenge to hit our target. And, and as we sort of were rolling over into, into 2020 and this COVID thing was on the horizon, which as we all thought, you know, this thing could go on for weeks. So uh, there was no point in, in, in sort of deferring the final close to, uh, to the middle of the year. You know, we thought there was going to be too much of a COVID distraction in Q2 of last year. So we, so we deferred to the end of the year. And more by luck than judgment, that took us through the repeal of the Volcker Rule. And Barclays, who had been our you know, longest standing industry partner, you'll recall, of course, we have a very sort of strong industry connectivity line to, to, what we, to what we do. We want to connect the fintech community, you know, our portfolio, obviously, but even our pipeline back to, to the end users in a sort of virtuous, uh, virtuous cycle that, that benefits everyone. Barclays had been our partner for, for six years and they turned around to us and said, look, hey, you know, post this Volcker repeal, you know, we would love to be long-term partners with you. Can we invest? So they came on board as a, as a significant investor. And then very rapidly on the follow, uh, JP Morgan, who had been close to being a partner of ours many years ago before they set their in-residence program up, you know, that we had a very good conversation with them and they were you know, very positive on the partnership attributes that, that we could bring to their own digitization efforts. And, uh, and so they actually came in uh, as a significant investor as well, which you know, we're, we're really, really excited about you know, what that does for our kind of you know, closeness of relationship with those institutions, the operating leverage that it brings to, to, to ourselves. 
to the portfolio and, of course, the benefits it brings to them in terms of Intel and, and horizon scanning and connectivity is 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 the illuminate sort of partnership model, you know, it, you know, it rendered in the long term, which is which is very exciting. I'm glad you said that at the end there, because I think it's um, you know you, you were talking there about to the to the to the stable, I guess, to you guys that it's uh, you know, it's positive, but it's also very much to the businesses there. You t- you're talking about two massive names there in Barclays and J.P. Morgan, and obviously that's great. Shows great credibility into what you and the team have uh, have achieved in still a relatively short amount of time over that sort of period. What was it you think that that was the pull for for those two firms to get involved? Look, I, I, I think the industry as a whole has spent, you know, a lot of time trying to work out, you know, what innovation means and what digitization means. And I think somewhere along the line, the rhetoric changed from innovation to digitization, which I think much more of, you know, as as applied innovation, right? So I think organizations are getting much more results focused in that space rather than, you know, sort of the the ivory tower lab type environment that, that perhaps we had seen, you know, for, for the last, you know, almost decade, uh, you know, or so, you know, an awful lot of what had been going on in the industry around the lab space has been relatively disconnected from the business. And I think, you know, both those organizations have notably really strongly integrated their, their, you know, innovation and digitization efforts to a very, very, in a very business aligned business aligned way right and so one of the fundamental tenets of you know of the dna of illuminate since the day we set the firm up was to try and kind of institutionalize some of the learnings i'd had from going from being you know the 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 manager or the trader and then the manager at the bank to being the entrepreneur and yeah, I think we discussed before kind of that horrible moment of self-realization, which is, uh, oh, my goodness, was it really this difficult to sell me something I desperately needed when I was that managing director at a bank? The answer was yes. These organizations are you know, really on the front foot in trying to address that challenge by putting you know, by putting those efforts, you know, very, very tightly to to the guy on the desk, you know, the guy in controlling, the guy in ops, the guy in technology. And, you know, we are a very scalable horizon scanning and connectivity mechanism for them, right? You know, we, we are cut from the same cloth in terms of our sort of institutional DNA. And we are, you know, 15 people across the globe looking at, you know, up to 200 of these types of companies a quarter and, you know, distilling the raw essence uh, of that back to what is, you know, credible, workable, useful to uh, to our partner group. So, you know, it, it's, it's a very ben- mutually beneficial and symbiotic relationship. We get a lot of intel from our partners about, you know, their needs and the needs of the broader marketplace. We think that makes us smarter investors and, and they get, a lot of uh, a lot of market uh, intel and connectivity across the broader fintech landscape. Sounds like a good win-win. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> so lo- last time we spoke, and, it, and and I think you actually wrote, and I'm just trying to get my numbers right in terms of where it is. But that magazine there, ish, <laughs> but yep. behind me, the cover of the fintech phoenix of the financial technologist. You were, you you put a great article in there talking about the sort of uh, petrol on the bonfire of uh, of digitalization and, and, and innovation within within the sector. And it was probably you know, not far off a year, just over a year ago, I think that you that you uh, you first penned that and looked at, uh, at what we were what we we're doing. And I think you very early on called the opportunity in the marketplace. From my perspective, I was just highlighting it to you earlier on. I don't think in twenty years I've seen as busier a market in financial technology of, of having sat there and watched it. Your businesses and or the companies who you guys are, are, are working with are, are seeing unprecedented levels of success in many you know, many parts that I've seen. We're seeing an enormous amount of activity in, in, in the space. Talk us through some of the highlights of the stable and what's been happening uh, for, you, for you guys so far. Well, I, I mean, well, let, before I do that, if you don't mind, I mean, let's just pick up on what you said actually about the macro environment. Because I think when we spoke before, you know, we were just into COVID. And, you know, and, uh, you know, I think at the time I was probably talking, I've certainly talked about it a heck of a lot since. We'd kind of gone through this, great emergency digitization of, of March 2020, where everybody suddenly kind of had to move to, to, to work from home. 
And, uh, you know, and so here we are, you know, more than a year later. And, you know, what's the legacy of that? Right. And, you know, the legacy of that, you know, as I think we discussed at the time, it really has swept away, you know, a few of the sort of previously held tenets around what was what was not possible on the technology migration path of, of, of large institutions, right? Now, again, that's not to say that security doesn't matter. Of course it does. That compliance doesn't matter. Of course it does. And, you know, those are very, obviously, two very core challenges that, that, that institutions have to deal with in, in this new, in this new uh, MO. But, but I do think that the, the digitization journey and the cloud migration journey in particular have had a massive shot in the arm. No, uh, I guess, well, maybe, maybe there is a pun intended, you know, from, 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 from COVID, right? And so, you know, you know, doesn't mean everyone's a winner, but, but there has definitely been, you know, there's definitely been a big, you know, a big acceleration, right? And so, uh, as you're aware, you know, we are a thematic based investor if you you know if you looked at fund one there was you know there was a few data themes in there there was some reg tech themes in there there was some fixed income electronification type uh, type plays and some risk mitigation type plays obviously kind of all of that carries over into into fund two which is you know really sort of the successor fund uh, to, to fund one in terms of its definition couple of new additional themes starting to emerge into that space. We made our first wealth tech investment in a, in a, a Canadian company called Digit. We made our first uh, ESG investments into uh, Net Purpose and, and Eve Blue, who are really both addressing the, the emerged need for impact and ESG data transparency, in some cases to actually fill just total gaps in the data you know, in, in others to actually help people kind of source and understand the data. I guess the other big theme that, that you will have seen as sort of mining in fund two, and again, uh, possible pun intended, is, is what we've been doing in the digital asset space, where we've made a number of, of investments uh, from a crypto custody to market connectivity to node, node management sort of infrastructure as a service. It's been a very interesting, well, all of those have been very interesting spaces. And, and I'll sort of pause for a second to say you're definitely wasted, don't you? You should be a tabloid headline writer with puns like that, <laughs> puns like those. Oh, yeah, dear, dear. Oh, dear. Se- seamlessly brought in. But that, that digital asset space it, it has been very, very interesting. And you've seen, if we, if we look back at it, I think you, you, we were probably talking about you know, no blockchain investments at the start. And now this, this sort of creeping emergence of digital assets in, in the portfolio being something which you've put more and more uh, time and invest into. Talk, talk to us about that sort of metamorphosis for you. Yeah, sure. So uh, look, I think you're right. And it's a good, it's a good recollection. We didn't do a single blockchain investment in, in fund one. Uh, fund one was deploying from the end of 15 to the end of 18, which really was, you know, sort of the peak of the blockchain sort of Absolutely. first wave hype cycle. And, you know, candidly, you know, the reasons that we didn't in, invest in blockchain back then you know wasn't because like we're blockchain luddites but uh, you know it was a small fund it was a hot space the valuations that were getting printed in the space were incredibly high compared to the rest of certainly of, of you know capital markets fintech which was the predominant focus of the fund and most importantly it was very much a set of technologies that were looking for problems, right? And so, you know, high valuations often in companies that had pretty close to zero, zero revenue because they were, they were really still trying to find the the, the landing zone for, 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 for how they turned technology into solution. And, you know, as I would have said to you before, we are absolutely a, you know, business problem and solution first investor and technology second rather than technology for the sake of technology. Now, mm. what has changed as we evolve into fund two is, you know, and, and again, this may be COVID legacy, you know, or it may just be, you know, the natural evolution of the market was, you know, we'd gone through, you know, the first Bitcoin hype cycle. We'd gone through all of the, you know, the ICOs and altcoins, We'd started to see, you know, much more happening in the world of 
tokenization, securitization, we'd see the stable coins come to market. Whether you believe in Bitcoin or whether you believe in stable coins or whether you believe in tokenization or, you know, you know, you don't need to believe in any one of those things, right? You just have to believe that some forms of digital assets and some forms of, you know, processing of assets on digital rails, you know, is going to be part of the future of finance. I think we saw enough institutional interest in those rails and the asset classes that run on those rails to say, okay, there needs to be institutional grade infrastructure here, right? And if you draw the parallel back to fund one, you say, okay, well, you know, you, you did a lot in fixed income electronification in fund one, what was that about, right? And so you know, if you think about, the relative states of electronification of the markets where you know equities has always been up here and fx is there and fixed income was here right fixed income was never going from there to there right it's just a different asset class but the requirements of best execution efficiency algorithmic trading meant that there were a certain set of components that were going to be needed to close the stack right so you know, we invested in Axe Trading, which was fixed income OMS, EMS. We invested in Transfic, which was you know, next generation market connectivity and that sort of Broadway stroke ion space. And, you know, and, 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 and so that was, that was how we mined that opportunity. And then you look at the digital asset space and actually what you have here is something that when you try to evaluate it on that same scale, it, it, it's kind of hard, right? Because actually... It's fundamentally, you know, started off as an electronic market. It hasn't started off as a voice, uh, as as a voice market. But of course, it's it's a it's an electronic retail market, a very very fragmented retail retail market. And so you look at that and you say, okay, you know, it's it's natively electronic, almost by definition, in fact, exactly by definition, right? But for it to be for it to evolve to become institutional. Right. It's missing so many parts. Right. Like, you know, like custody is the first part. Right. Fidelity or BlackRock or Deutsche Bank or whoever can't start trading billions of dollars of crypto or, you know, or any other form of digital asset if someone's got to keep it on a hard drive or someone's got to keep it on a USB. So in the same way that, you know, we needed institutional grade custody for bearer bonds 100 years ago right we now need institutional custody for you know these types you know for these types of assets as well and so you know that was our first foray into the space we invested in a crypto custody business called curve five months later it was uh, it was acquired by paypal which is either a great thing or a really annoying thing depending uh, depending on whether my glass is half full you know, or, 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 or half empty, my, my investors were delighted that we'd managed to turn, you know, turn a kind of quick, a quick return there. Personally, I would have rather have been in, you know, in, in, in that opportunity space, having identified a missing piece of infrastructure, you know, and put the position on, I'd, I'd have rather been exposed to that for five years than, than six months. As it happens, we then made our second investment in the space, which was Copper, who are very much in uh, in that same sort of crypto uh, crypto custody crypto custody space, we've invested in Talos, which is market connectivity. So think about institutional needs around you know having access to more than one trading venue, the requirement to try and create some element of best execution, uh, and indeed some element of consistent execution, right? You can't be beholden to one exchange if that exchange is down or the liquidity isn't there. You know, so so again, in the same way that we have those platforms providing multi-venue connectivity for fixed income or for or for equities, institutionalization of digital assets requires the same thing. And Talos are are are, are out there, are out there doing that. And then, and then, of course, you know, you have all of the infrastructure that this world is operating on, right? So, you know, the blockchain requires, you know, requires some form of proof or mining or staking or, you know, the infrastructure to do that on. And so we made, a, we made an investment in, in a company called Blockdeem and who are in that sort of infrastructure as a service for the, uh, the digital, asset, digital asset space. And there will be more to come, right? You know, 
there's there's well documented challenges around KYC. You know, great companies like Chainalysis doing a doing doing a great job there. But 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 there's 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 a lot more there in terms of in terms of KYC, AML, travel rule, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd, I'd expect us to see us do more before this fund is fully deployed. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because this is this is an extremely strategic way of looking at things. And if you look at a, a number of you know, for investment firms, you'll see a sort of spray and pray sort of uh, methodology in, in numerous instances to it. But I think this sort of, uh, the, you know, the sort of fund one and fund two sort of process that you've just spoken about there has been really interesting and, and look, digital assets has been everything i've been hearing on the show for the last last year or so in various different sort of again still phases of of hype curve i think it's you know sort of uh, undulates at, at, even at this sort of stage depending on what's happening and what the headlines are about elon and whoever else doing what you know what, whatever else with, within it yeah but i think that you know, the, the big change from when you were talking there as, as you say between you know 15 to 18 and and uh, where we're looking at now there's been yeah that institutional interest in it, and even and, and even the state in, interest in it at various different stages to legitimise the, yeah, the the whole opportunity of it. So rather than uh, you know uh, bankers seeing it as effectively money laundering and, and and such like, to actually seeing seeing you know the, the power and possibility of the tech, but also the the uh, the likelihood of this becoming a, a genuine asset class. And I sort of have my thoughts as to whether it, it, it is now officially seen as an out and out asset class or, or, or not. And but it's certainly heading, you know, lurching towards there with ever increasing velocity. It's a very, very interesting yeah. time and it seems to be well positioned by you guys. Yeah, look, I look, I, I think that I think there's a couple of things in there to kind of unpack, right? So so the first one is like you don't even have to believe in digital assets, right? Like you just have to believe that the digital rails that have been designed for digital assets are a more potentially efficient set of rails to process the future of finance on, right? So, you know, like all of the, you know, derivatives or, you know, industry securitizations or loans or muni bonds or whatever it is, right, that go through, you know, processes that were designed 30 years ago you know, now find they, they they do run digitally, which is kind of one of the reasons I find the concept of digitize, digitization slightly amusing is that everything is digital at some level, but but not natively digital, right? And so there, you know, there is a lot to gain for the industry to use these natively digital rails to have much more, you know, efficient transaction processing, irrespective of whether the thing up front is something that we can consider today to be a native digital asset. So, so that so that's kind of point point number one, and then it kind of ties back to 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 the second point, which is as with fund one, you know, we're not trying to pick winners in terms of you know back to your point about spray and pray, you know, fixed income electronification. If you ask 99 investors, how do you express a view on fixed income electronification? They're going to say, invest in a trading venue. And we didn't, right? That's not to say that we won't. But but what we did was we invested in the, the rails, the picks and shovels of the, you know, the fixed income electronification gold rush. And what we're doing here is the picks and shovels of the digital asset gold rush that doesn't require us to say, we think Bitcoin is going to be the winner, or we think that you know Ethereum is going to be the winner, or Ripple, or anything, you know, or, or or anything else. A rising tide kind of floats all boats, right? And 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 so, you know, these infrastructure plays will win out as long as there is a migration, uh, you know, within 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 the asset class as as a whole, and irrespective of 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 individual winners and losers. Without looking at the, and, and being intimate in my knowledge of the uh, of the data, you 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 guys seem to have a, a sort of healthy knack of outperforming the uh, the uh, the market and the picks that you're that you that you guys are making effectively and where your investments go. Tell tell me a little bit about the secrets behind that. What it, you know what's 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 why is that working so well for you right now? Is it that strategy well, of just looking at what's what's hot and uh, making the right courses? Yeah. And I know we've spoken in the past about where it goes, but. You, you're not, I know you're not going to give it all away, but what's uh, what's working well for you at the moment? 
so so look a, a you're very kind and b you know if 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 this doesn't work out for you there's always a job for you in there's always a job for you in pr at illuminate but uh <laughs> look you know you know let, let, let's start with a little bit of humility right like we're an emerging manager right so you know i'll, I'll tell you that it's all working perfectly when we've returned our first fund you know many times over to our you know to our investors right you, you know but you know the underlying facts as they sit today you know fund one we made 12 investments we sold one to bloomberg in 2019 we did a partial sale of another one during covid last year you know we've returned about 16% of our investors capital so far so you know useful but not massively not massively material every single one of those other 11 companies has now gone on to raise money externally at high levels and the level at which we in, invested you know at, at least once if not multiple times and again that is an array of investors from you know some of the best recognized venture investors in the world Axel have invested in two of our fund one companies Privitar and, and more recently Genesis Citibank have uh, or City have gone on to invest in five of those 11 companies and then you know in between Axel and City you've got a plethora of other venture investors growth investors and you know and banks and 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 their users so so it feels like something is working because nothing's gone pop yet touch wood what is that well you know i think it comes back to your earlier point like we're not a generalist spray and pray investor right and it comes back to what i said around this kind of virtuous cycle right illuminate is sat there spending a huge amount of time and effort talking to the industry the buy side the sell side the infrastructure players understanding you know what are the problems that need solving now you know and introducing our pipeline to those organizations and individuals and 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 you know getting a view on that you know, and 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 really kind of deploying capital where we see that there is already, you know, an interest, you know, and a readiness in the market to adopt the sort of solutions that we are that we are looking at. So, you know, we're not the sort of venture investor, and it always amazes me that there are guys out there that do this well. That that are you know going to sit there and you know have somebody come in with a piece of polystyrene foam on a piece of cardboard and say, we're going to put some technology in there and it's going to count your steps and that's going to be Fitbit and it's going to be worth billions of dollars. Uh, you know, hmm. it's like, wow, I, I, how does somebody evaluate that? Or, you know, we're going to create a software platform and people are going to rent out the spare room in their houses <laughs> to total strangers who won't mostly murder them, uh, you know, in their beds <laughs> and, and steal all their stuff. Right. I mean, like, you know, the ability to say yes to those types of investments is a, is a remarkable thing. Well, that's not what we do, right? Yeah. You know, we are collecting industry pain points and we are sifting through an incredible pipeline of solutions and we're just trying to, we're just trying to find a fit. Um, you know, this is not over the horizon technology. This is, again, it's back to that. You know, this is what is the market need now you know, what needs, you know, what needs to be solved, right? And look, I mean, not everything in our portfolio goes as well, you know, as well as everything else, right? You know, I've said for many years of my career, even before setting up a venture business, you know, you want to be, you want to be three months ahead of a problem, not three years ahead of a problem. Sometimes, you know, you think you're three months ahead, and it turns out you were, you were three years ahead, right? And, you know, that that can be, you know, at best painful, and at worst, and at worst fatal, so you know, we're not going to get it all right. We are a venture investor. We're taking venture risk, but but we're taking it in a in a in a very structured and and informed way, right? So let's see yeah. what pops out at the end. Let, let's let's talk again in three years when uh, or four years when Fund One is kind of getting towards its end of life, and yeah, we'll find out if your kind words were 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 right or not. I'm never wrong. I'm never wrong. <laughs> so I hope you're not. Uh, I hope you're not. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll be checking in every year as we go through it as well. But this is. I think for, for me that that sort of point there about collecting industry pain points and that there's been well over a hundred of these, these shows that I've run now over the, over the course of last year. And if I look at that common theme of the companies who I think have generally been spectacular over that period, 
that sort of seeing what the market needs now and what needs to be solved, I think has been you know, a, a underlying and, and critical part of those businesses who, who, who've succeeded. That comes through you know, exactly in, in what you've just spoken about and is a, is a great way to, uh, to, you know, to start this conversation. Mark, I can't believe how quickly these conversations go every time that we talk. And I feel like I could be on it for you know, another two hours and not even scratch the surface of everything we wanted to do. So let, let, let's let's finalise just with a, with, with, with a couple more questions, a couple of final questions and final thoughts for you. Number one of which is, is look, you, you've, you've sort of, I think you've probably answered a little bit so far here at the moment. Where, where, where would you be pinning your thoughts on what's going to be happening in the marketplace over the uh, over the next six to twelve months? And secondly, what's you know, what's exciting for you in, in the run up to the end of twenty twenty one? What what can we expect to see in here? Okay, so really good question. So look, I think I think over the six month horizon, you know, I think everybody is just struggling with like, what does the return to the office look like? Not, not, not the return to work, which is what people keep calling it. It's like, I think everyone feels like they've been working pretty yeah. hard, but, but, you know, what does that return to work look like, you know, and, and what is the new, the new normal? And, you know, like we're both living in jurisdictions where, you know, that we, we have no lockdown anymore, right. You know, we're open and we're, we're nowhere near normal. Right. So, so that's an interesting challenge. We actually have made one investment in Fund 2 that addresses that quite specifically. You know, a company called Time is Limited, which is, which is like doing data analysis of how teams interact, how diaries work, how they interact with the collaboration products, whether that's Slack or Teams or Zoom, you know, what the strength of people's networks are, if they've been onboarded remotely post covid versus people that were perhaps brought on you know you know face to face pre covid so i think that's a really i think that's a really interesting a really interesting challenge that's ahead of us from our perspective uh, you know i thought things were going to get quieter following the the the, the final close of, of fund 2 uh, at the start of this year and don't forget of course we'd already been deploying for nearly 2 years at that you know at that point it was actually remarkable just how much busier we got. So the, the pipeline kind of stepped up another level. So you know, nearly we've worked been, for you. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we we've been we've been you know executing a number a, a number of deals. We've got a lot still floating around the top of the hopper. And so as I sort of move into 2022, you know, I'm starting to think about you know like fund three look like. Who are my anchor investors for that? Should we be launching a, a growth fund that kind of does the next stage, uh, the next stage as well? So you know, it might be time to start whipping the fund three deck into shape and and starting and starting to beat that uh, to beat that drum. Uh, I might take a week off in August first, but uh, but but I think coming back into Q four, that's probably that's probably where a bit of my focus goes. No time for these weeks off, Mark. It sounds like you're too busy for that. <laughs> what's a well, vacation been, exactly yeah, yeah. i'm sure you managed to keep yourself busy in it and nevertheless my absolute pleasure um pearls of wisdom i'm, I'm so pleased to hear uh, just just how well things have, have, have been going despite you know what what I, I, I cast my mind back to that that year ago when we were talking and and uh you know, again, it was that that's what we were talking about Sequoia and they're sort of uh, everyone batting down the hatches and this is going to get get bumpy and and you know the validity of that or whether it's gamesmanship was an, was always a question mark. But you know what was was very interesting was the uncertainty that everyone faced at that sort of stage and and to see the businesses that have been attached to you thrive so well and your company in turn uh, continue to gain momentum and get that sort of uh, validity through you know everything but all, you know, increase, even more so that Barclays and JP Morgan stuff is, is just uh, absolute magic to see so congratulations on everything thanks so much again for, you, for, for being so generous with your time and coming back on the show if anyone wants to get in touch with you and find out a little bit more what's the best way of doing that mb at illuminatefinancial.com uh, or drop me or drop me a LinkedIn uh, always interested to hear from people fantastic Mark, thanks so much. Have a great day today. I know you've been back to back since 5.30 in the morning. You are doing well on it and uh, we will doubtless see you again very soon. Really appreciate your time. Really appreciate the opportunity. Always a pleasure, Toby. Take care. Good man. And thank you all for watching. We will see you soon on another episode of Fintech Focus TV. Thanks a lot. Thanks.